I'm a recovering person. I, I had drug addiction when I was young, and uh, at 30, I, be, I got, found my way to recovery. Um, and I never really intended on um, advocacy uh, in terms of, in, in terms of a, pu a public face to it. Um, I did a lot of work sort of within my community. Um, and then when I was 17 years clean and sober, I wrote a book about my life, which, uh, which I had to get public about because I had to go out and sell the book. A lot of the book had to do with my struggles uh, and my eventual recovery. Um, and so that, that just, because there's so little uh, advocacy when it comes to addiction, publicly. Uh, be, be, I mean, there are people who, for a time, might, you know, say something or do something. Uh, most people are afraid um, because of the stigma, because of outright discrimination. Um, there are, uh, you know, uh, places in our, our, our society where if you admit to these kinds of things, your career is over. And so, uh, I didn't have that problem. I was in the film business at the time. Uh, I was an actor. It was not really, it wasn't going to harm me to do this. And because of the family I come from, uh, the same family as my cousin Patrick, um, we, were, we were initiated into public service. I mean, it was really a, it was a, uh, an ethic in our family, and it wasn't, it wasn't baloney. It was. It was really, you know, the ask not what uh, your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country was a real ethic in our family. And as soon as I realized that I could use my so-called misfortune or or misbehavior, uh, both. As soon as I realized I could use that to to some good, uh, there was no question I would do it. I think there's strength in numbers, and I think one of the problems that we've had with, in the mental health community, uh, in the addiction community, and in the, you know, the folks with intellectual disabilities is that we, they're turf battles. Um, we're all in this together. This is, you know, as Patrick says, this is about uh, chemistry, not character. And so this is an issue that uh, affects us from the neck up. I believe, I mean, I've, I've spent a lot of time studying both anecdotally and uh, in, in it, it, the science of addiction, and I know that it is a brain illness. I mean, I know it from my own personal experience, and we know it. Um, so the, the fact that there are all these people together who care about the brain and its manifestations in these ways, um, we should speak with one voice. And that's hard to do uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, I think this society often places a premium on celebrity. And celebrity's good. I mean, people ask me all the time in my advocacy why we can't recreate in, in addiction what was done in the HIV movement. And the reason we don't is because particularly with addiction, people who recover are basically two or three different types. One, they, they, they do recover, they, they, they walk out of the darkness into the light and they never want to be reminded of that again. Um, the, other, the other person walks out, they wouldn't mind doing something, but they feel that it's too risky to their current life. Okay, and the third group are People who find recovery, and there are millions of these folks who are in 12-step rooms around the world, and they're anonymous below ground. So, and they're doing amazing work with each other and helping people get sober one-on-one, -on -one. one alcoholic raising, you know, putting their hand out to another is the most powerful social engine on the planet. I think the American, the, the uh, director of the American Psychiatric Association in the 1950s said that Alcoholics Anonymous is the most significant social invention since Christ. And I would, I, 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 it would be hard for me to disagree with them in terms of what it's been able to do in terms of transforming people's lives. But those folks aren't public. And they're not public for a variety of reasons. A misguided uh, understanding of the traditions of 12-step of rooms, a lot of reasons. But 
All of those things combined means that we, we, have, we have difficulty with people standing up and being public and really putting themselves on the barricades. I mean, at some point, we have to demand as a community, the mental health community, the addiction community, that we will not be ignored. And we have been ignored. And we get, you know, there's plenty of times now in the, in the last couple of years where, where the, the conversation veers off of treatment and services to, uh, you know, uh, guns or whatever it is, whatever. This is a difficult problem. It's expensive. It's difficult. Um, if, you, if you treat somebody with addictive disease, you can't just give them a pill. It doesn't work that way. You have to treat every aspect of their life. It's expensive. It's costly. It takes energy. Do we have the commitment? That's what keeps people from standing up. It's hard. My uncle said, though, President Kennedy said, you know, when he was asked about going to the moon, he said, we, we, we don't do these things because they're easy. We do them because they're hard. What is our society about? We seem to have gotten to a point where the problem's too great, you know, pass it on to somebody else, blame somebody, avoid it. That's not American. It's not the way we do business. As a community, we have to be organized and we have to vote. And, and we have to hold our elected officials accountable for changing the landscape. If we don't do that, forget about talking. Forget it. It doesn't work that way. Money and grassroots. If you don't have those two things, you might as well move.